Thanks very much, and well, good afternoon, everyone. Right. Welcome to this uh, book celebration and discussion. Uh, a wonderful book by uh, Wolfgang Streich and Ruth Dukes, Democracy at Work, Contract Status and Post-Industrial Justice. And if any of you haven't had a chance to read it yet, I would strongly recommend it. It's one of those rare academic books that is concise and accessible, yet brimming with ideas and detail and historical sweep, which is truly, truly uh, uh, wonderful and powerful in terms of the ideas that it's expressing. It's a book that you will learn a huge amount from, whether or not you agree with all of its parts. And I think what struck me in reading the book was that it's a book that it's difficult to imagine having been written by anyone other than our two authors. In this, um, in this age of excessive academic publishing and output, which can on occasion appear to be rather bland, this book breaks the, uh, bre breaks the trend and is really something to, to, to enjoy and, and celebrate as well as to learn from. It's also, I think, also for always form to say that an academic book is timely and topical, and that's not always true, but in this case, <laughs> It certainly is true. Um, it hardly needs saying at this moment in time with a wave of strikes uh, in the UK, um, which is, I don't know if, if the word unprecedented is, is, is appropriate. I'm not the expert to, to comment on that. But of course, around the world and in France in these last few weeks, we've seen a resurgence of political uh, uh, industrial action uh, renewed crises of capitalism and uh, uh, issues where democracy and work come together. And I think one of the, for me, one of the wonderful things about the, the work of both authors, which comes through in this book, is this combination of political economy and questions of social justice addressed in that political register and not merely as normative or abstract concerns, but with a historical narrative driving through. Um, it's also wonderful to have such a fantastic list of, of speakers who will be commenting on the book. I'm going to uh, introduce uh, all of the speakers now, so bear, do bear with me. And I, it means I won't have left Hugh a great deal to do who's chairing the second session, but can, <laughs> can, can make some, some comments of his own on, 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 on the proceedings. Um, I think, a feature of all of the commentators is that their work transcends the, the ivory towers of academia. These are all commentators who have engaged in the world as we experience it and as we experience the conflicts that emerge in the world between labor and capital. Um, I'm going to introduce the six speakers. So first, of, in the order that they will uh, present, uh, I appreciate that we are already running a little bit late, which means I will be extra firm on, on them to keep to their 15 to 20 minutes uh, maximum. So we have time for discussion uh, uh, from, from the audience, questions from the audience, as well as uh, from the authors. Um, first up will be uh, Kostas Lapovitsas, who is Professor of Economics in the Department of Economics at the School of Oriental and African Studies. He is a, a former student of LSE um, and Birkbeck and has been teaching at SOAS for some time now. He's written extensively on the political economy of capitalism, the relationship of finance and the development and interaction between market and non-market relations in the financial system. Perhaps outside of the discipline known, uh, certainly to me at least through his involvement through the Euro crisis, uh, with Syriza and was elected to the Greek Parliament in 2015 as a member of Syriza, uh, the author of uh, a relatively recent book on uh, the EU, the left case against the EU, uh, which was uh, influential in my own formative, uh, <laughs> formative experience of, of, of studying uh, the EU. Uh, then we will have Tonya Novitz, who is Professor of Labour Law at the University of Bristol Law School and the University of Bristol Center for Law at Work. She's a graduate of, of Canterbury and Balliol College, Oxford, um, and has held fellowships in the in International Institute for Labor Studies in Geneva, 
the European University Institute in Florence, University of Melbourne, and the University of Auckland. Auckland. And Auckland. A strange pronunciation. <laughs> She has researched and written extensively on labor rights, international and EU trade, sustainability and migration, and is currently chair of the steering committee of the International Labor Law Research Network. And then finally, in this first session, we have David Woodruff, who is Associate Professor of Comparative Politics in the Department of Government at the LSE, here at the LSE. He's held appointments at MIT and Harvard, the author of Money Unmade, Barter and the Fate of Russian Capitalism, which I think is, is uh, highly topical, even though this book was written some time ago. Um, researches in the area of money and corporate property rights, emerging markets and capitalist institutions in a volatile economic environment. David also runs the Political Economy in Public blog site. Uh, that will take us to a break, a coffee break, um, at which is scheduled at three. We may have a little bit of flexibility uh, there. And then in the second half uh, of the uh, afternoon's proceedings, we have three more speakers. Hannah Reed, um, who is sitting <laughs> in the front row, uh, a, a trade unionist expert in employment rights and employment relations. She's worked on employment and labor law policy for the uh, UK Trades Union Congress, the TUC, where she was a senior policy officer in the TUC's Equalities and Employment Rights Department. She now works for Unite, uh, the union, for, which for those of you that don't know, is the, I believe the second largest trade union in the UK with over 1.2 million members um, and is the coordinator of constitutional affairs at Unite Central Office, which is around the corner, I believe in, in Holborn. Um, we then have Lydia Hayes, so in the front row, uh, who is Professor of Labour Rights at the University of Liverpool in the School of Law and Social Justice, where she works and researches on issues of minimum wage, uh, devolution, labour standards, especially in care work and trade unions. Um, she's written extensively on care work, labour law, discrimination and the employment contract, and I noticed also recently on the impact of COVID, um, and is a member of the Feminist Legal Research and Action Network. And then Finally, uh, this afternoon, we have Richard Hyman. Where is Richard? Right at the back, who doesn't really need uh, an introduction here at LSE. Uh, he's been one of the most prominent figures in British and European employment relations for decades, written extensively on comparative industrial relations, collective bargaining, trade unionism, industrial conflict, and labor market policy. Uh, Richard has published far too much for me to mention here. Suffice it to say that he's the founding editor of the European Journal of Industrial Relations and is now Emeritus Professor of Industrial Relations in the LSE's Department of Management. Okay, we got there. So just, just remains for me to introduce the two authors of the book, who also require very little introduction, and, and, I, and I won't I won't go on too much because I don't want to cut into the time that we have for discussion, but Ruth Dukes is Professor of Labour Law uh, at the University of Glasgow and Principal Investigator on the European Research Council funded project Work on Demand, Contracting for Work in a Changing Economy. She joined the University of Glasgow in 2005 and holds degrees from Edinburgh, Humboldt, uh, LSE, you name it. Uh, she's the author of The Labour Constitution, The Enduring Idea of Labour Law. Um, which I do mention because it, it was such a, a stunning book for me to read personally and was very influential on my own work on authoritarian liberalism, particularly the, uh, the, the excavation of so much of interest in the, in the interwar period and the Weimar uh, regime. Um, and has uh, most uh, recently, of course, uh, authored the book before us, uh, Democracy at Work. And uh, finally, Wolfgang Streich, is Emeritus Director of the Max Planck Institute for the Study of Societies in Cologne, an economic sociologist who has done groundbreaking work in the political economy of capitalism, the author of many books, including Buying Time, The Delayed Crisis of Democratic Capitalism, my personal favorite, um, and How Will Capitalism End? Not if or when, but how. We're still, I think we're still waiting for the for the concluding chapter. Um, 
Critical Encounters, most recently Critical Encounters, Capitalism, Democracy and Ideas. All these books were published with Verso. And Wolfgang is also a regular contributor to the New Left Review, where he writes some blistering pieces for their blog entitled Sidecar. You're in for a ride if you get to read those, which I have been doing with much enthusiasm recently. Um, one more person I, I would like to introduce, which is Hugh Collins, is my esteemed colleague for the second time in the uh, law school at uh, LSE. Um, Hugh is the Emeritus Vinerian Professor of English Law and a fellow at All Souls College, Oxford. He was previously Professor of English Law and Head of the Law Department at LSE, uh, as well as being General Editor of our flagship journal, The Modern Law Review. Hugh is a fellow of the British Academy and is now the holder of the Castle Chair of Commercial Law at uh, the London School of Economics. And it's a great uh, uh, pleasure um, to, to be able to pass over to Hugh for the second uh, half of uh, today's uh, event. Okay, but before passing over to, to Ruth and, and Wolfgang, who I think are going to speak for very briefly, very brief time to introduce the book, each author, uh, sorry, each speaker will then have between 15 and 20 minutes. Um, and I would urge you to keep to that if possible so we can have some time for discussion. We, we will also be able to have some time for discussion in the second half. So without any further ado, I will hand over to Costas, who is up first. Um, no, do you have slides, Costas? No, no, no. Us first. Sorry? We were gonna go first. You're going, of course you're going first. Which is exactly where, <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for reminding me. I was so eager to hear from Costas. So like, let's just hear, let's just get straight to it. Um, my apologies, but Costas, do you have slides? No, I don't. Oh, well, that's perfect. Then I don't need to do anything with the screen at the moment other than to hand over to Ruth and Wolfgang. So we speak from here, is this? Yeah. You, you can speak from there, you can speak from here. It's totally up to you. Um, I think I'll just stay seated. And the main thing I want to say is thank you all so much for coming, um, the speakers and the audience and the chairs. Uh, thank you very much and to Mike and Alexandra for the organization. Absolutely delighted to be here. This is a room that I remember most for our weekly choir practice when I was a PhD student here. Um, I want to speak very briefly about my and our motivation for writing the book, because I think hearing why someone wrote something can be helpful in, in understanding the substance. Um, so I have uh, myself a long-standing admiration for Wolfgang's work um, since the time of my postgraduate studies in Berlin and here. Um, though he has become famous for much else, he was interested early on in his career in industrial relations and even labor law um, and wrote about um, labor law in Germany, works councils law, works constitution law in particular. Um, and I drew on that work in my postgraduate studies. And then when writing my labor constitution book that Mike's kindly mentioned, I drew on Wolfgang's work to argue for a, a law and political economy approach to the study of labor law. Uh, so a kind of, you know, an approach that combines the two perspectives. And in one sense, I think this book, Democracy at Work, picks up and sharpens that argument. As we make clear in the preface, um, the book is the outcome of a meeting between two disciplines. We write labor law and political economy and is intended to be productive for both. Um, so that's the first thing that I think the book does is to um, re reinforce this argument in favor of law, the, the, the um, productive combination of law and political economy when it comes to studying labor law. In another sense, the book is a response to a renewed interest in the idea of democracy at work, which we had observed uh, particularly among scholars working in the fields of political philosophy and politics. So thinking here uh, in particular of Elizabeth Anderson's 2017 book on private government and a 2018 article by Alex Gurevich, um, very uh, much cited article on the right to strike. Um, one of the striking things about this work, as, as well as its focus on the, the notion of democracy at work, was the author's, uh, and I'm sorry to say it, but the author's complete failure to engage with, even to acknowledge uh, 
the existence of very significant bodies of work that had already been written on that topic. Um, maybe not in politics and political philosophy, but by the classical sociologists, of course, by scholars of industrial relations and scholars of labor law. Um, so we wanted to kind of gently correct that omission. Now, of course, these, much of this work that we're talking about is by now old, um, written at the end of the 19th century or during the 20th century. And while one shouldn't assume that these old theories and old arguments fit with the very changed circumstances of today, neither, we thought, should one assume that it's necessary to reinvent the wheel. So instead, what we wanted to do, we thought there would be value in revisiting some of the old work, the old theories, and considering carefully their relevance today. Um, and that's what we do in the book. And in doing so, we focus especially on the concepts, contract, status, and industrial justice. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. I'm, uh, I'm, I can't avoid saying something on the first time I was in this room here. Which, which was, I think, uh, ten years ago at a, at a thing called called a power breakfast. Uh, why they invited me to this, I have no idea. Uh, but it was about someone who had written a biography of of Alan Greenspan, and there were all these Alan Greenspan fans in this in this room at the power. But incidentally, the the croissants they had were the worst croissants I've ever had. In <laughs> <laughs> so power power doesn't always reward you for <laughs> for, for things. And uh, I, I remember one sentence when when this biographer at the end said uh, the the one thing important about Alan Greenspan is that uh, he didn't need a theory. He had a model of the American economy right in his bones. <laughs> and I, I was really impressed with this. <laughs> he imagined all these equations and they all in the, yeah, so so uh, uh, this is my second time in this in this beautiful room. And uh, I can only reinforce something that, that Ruth said. Incidentally, there, Ruth, Ruth said something about uh, how, we, how we got together. She, she is uh, completely um, uh, trained in the, in the German tradition of, um, of, of labor law and, and including to, to, the, to the British uh, or, or English tradition. And uh, uh, absolutely fluent in the history of, uh, of uh, German labor law in the 1920s, which is where I began to, uh, to, to, to think about these things. So we have a, <laughs> we have a shared language on, this, on these things. Between us sits this guy, Otto Kahnfreund, who, who was German and then came to, came to this university, I suppose. And she's one of the, uh, the great living Otto Kahnfreund uh, specialists and fans <laughs> so uh, but 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 now i want to emphasize and then i stop uh, one of the points that uh, uh, was made at, at right right at the beginning this interest in bringing together uh, politics and law and the idea of justice embedded in a theory of conflict yeah uh, modern theories of democracy uh, have for some reason sort of turned into theories of uh, of normative uh, unity. Yeah, at the end of a debate, there is a normative uh, resolution. Whereas we, who have started trade unions and uh, and collective bargaining from early on, I, I used to do, during my time at Frankfurt University. I used to hang out more often at the headquarters of IG Metall than at the Institut für Sozialforschung. Yeah. And so it was Otto Brenner and not uh, Theodor Adorno who was my, my star. Otto Brenner was the president of, of, uh, of, of IG Metall, the Eisen Otto. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, when I, the, what I remembered was that democracy has to open up a space for conflict and that if it is just oriented towards the generation of uh, consensus there is a mistake here 
because we are talking about a society that has a deeply built in conflict. That is the conflict between labor and capital over the question of how much or how little capital has to concede to labor in order to motivate it to continue to contribute to the production of privately held capital. Yeah? The problem is that the capital that a society produces is held by a very sh sh small number of people. And the rest need to be convinced one way or other to continue playing that game. You can call this class conflict. You can all call this democracy. Uh, and in a democracy, the in democratic institutions play an important role in determining how much uh, labor has to, is entitled to get uh, as, as the price of their contribution. And, and of course, it's not just the wage. It's, it is the welfare state. It, it is social security. It's all of these things together. And, and now, when I look back uh, at the time when uh, uh, this, when the 30 years after the first, the second world war sort of faded away, the memory of this fundamental cleavage in our democracies that need to be kept open rather than closed, that memory gradually disappeared. And, and uh, the memory evaporated of the need for uh, closing and only temporarily closing the gap between capital and labor so that some sort of continued cooperation would be possible, but only provisionally, be, because the question of who gets what is not a question that can be decided by, by, by a Supreme Court. It is a question that needs to be decided by a measure of, of, of strength, of, of force, of motivation. Uh, and and uh, this is something where I thought that uh, the memory of early theories of labor law and of uh, uh, industrial democracy uh, had to be revived after one more sense after the first world war it was completely clear in all countries that became democratized at the time that they needed free collective bargaining in addition to a parliament and it was also completely clear that these two were not uh, sort of necessarily uh, uh, good friends with each other yeah uh, there's a permanent, uh, that even, uh, I mean, T.H. Marshall after the Second World War in, in his famous lectures held here, London <laughs> School of Economics, uh, there is a clear conscious, a consciousness of the possibility that trade unions could, in the eyes of the state, misbehave. Whereas we would want to add that the state can misbehave in the eyes of trade unions and, and that there is no uh, general uh, uh, law that could adjudicate that question. Yeah? But it is there, the, the problem is there. But then sort of neoliberalism puts, puts it away and it ends up with this very strange idea that a society with a kind of uh, public that modern societies have uh, Rupert Murdoch running running the newspapers and, and increasingly the television programs, that such a society could, through public debate, substitute for free collective bargaining as the measure of strength, as, as a place where where the where, where the, the 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 depth of uh, of needs is being tested in a, a conflict, hopefully regulated, but we now see in France. And I'm from Germany now. And last Monday, we had the, the first thing close to a general strike, uh, uh, which, <laughs> which really wakened up some people. Yeah? It's very interesting. People sort of learn from these things. So that's what I want to say. And that's the sort of political, uh, political basis of this, please. Thanks very much. I'll turn straight over to Costas. You want to stand? I can't think when I'm sitting down. But, uh, I've got to stand. So, um, um, thank you very much for the invite to the organizers. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to um, address you and uh, speak about this powerful book, which I've read with great pleasure. Mike tells me I've got 15 to 20 minutes, so I better be quick. There's a lot to say, 
not very much time. The book has, has already been said by the authors. It's um, uh, about law at the meeting point with political economy. That makes it particularly interesting because he has political awareness and political aims. And in doing so, it spells out very clearly the peculiar character of labor law that it can affect things. It can, it can make things happen. It can influence um, relations at work in the direction of justice or not, depending on how the law is structured. Um, the book makes a strong case for democracy at work. Um, I fully concur with that. How can anybody who takes a critical stance can disagree with that? The real question is, what does that mean? And how does it pan out? Here, without further ado, and because I want to make best use of time, I will say that I find the distinction and the relationship between contract and status particularly useful, which is the analytical, the analytical uh, driver of the, the book. Um, and I want to go back to that. I want to talk about that. That's really what I took strongly from the book. And I want to make some analytical points about it. Um, I cannot speak as a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer, obviously. But I can speak about it as a political economist. And I thought I might have some interesting or relevant things to say about status in particular, which um, is an important analytical concept uh, deployed here. Um, what can be said about status? A lot of things can be said about it, obviously. Um, what I will come up with are uh, things that um, I've recently developed in my own work. It's inevitable. And I find the issues raised here particularly relevant. Two things I will mention, and I will develop a little bit two issues which um, critically engage with the book and hopefully help spur the discussion forward. One is that status, as I understand it from the book, is, is inextricably connected to this, is what we might call the organizational structure of capital. What does, what does capital look like? Capital, I mean, is the the, the the unit of production here. What is, what is the, what's the organizational structure of capital? And in particular, big business. Big business today, what does, what does that look like? And what does that mean for status? At least that's how I uh, understood it and interpreted it. And the second has to do with the role of the state, which makes a strong appearance in the book. Um, and I wanna say a couple of things about that too. To me, Status, the way it's used in the book, is also linked to property rights and how property rights um, should be understood today and how they've changed given the change in the structure of capital in the role of the state. And to me, the connection between contract and, and, and um, status should pivot or does pivot on property rights. And I want to say a couple of things about that. Um, now, what can we say then about the structure of capital from perspective of status? In other words, what is the capitalist and what is the wage worker? What is the, the other side of the contract? Now, ownership and control have been split in mature capitalism for, for a very long time. Berlin means make a strong appearance in the book. Um, other people in neoclassical economics have discussed this from a very long time ago, Coase and so on. It's a well-known um, characteristic of contemporary um, capitalism. The period of post-war period of industrial citizenship to which the book refers and discusses um, is really a period of giant multinational corporations dominating for these times for this production structures. And that's really what we can think of as defining the status of the, uh, that side of the, employer of the employment contract. What about today? What can be said about today? Because this is about today. This is one of the concerns of the book as well. Now, it seems to me that the answer must be structured in terms of 
global production networks, which make an appearance in the book too. The answer must be structured in terms of global production networks in order to understand the status of labor and the status of capital within that. Um, at the core of global production networks still stand multinational corporations. Yeah, they are still there as in for these times, but not similar to for these times. In what way? In a way that matters for status, both of labor and of capital. Subsidiaries, uh, multinational corporations of the 50s and the 60s um, would have their net global networks, but they will be networks of subsidiaries with direct property rights. The, the, the multinational corporation would have direct property rights. So property rights come into it straight away. And the property rights would give rights of command and rights of um, uh, dictating terms to the component parts uh, of the network. These would be sustained by, um, as I say, by command. Global production networks today don't operate that way. Contract comes into it. They're sustained by contracts. Um, now, how are we to think about it? I think a Marxist take would help. What are we talking about here? We're talking about the interlinkage of industrial circuits through contract, articulated through contract into one grand articulated circuit across the world. That articulated circuit, depending on contract and not on property rights, um, internalizes trade and still allows for control by the multinational corporation at the core, the lead multinational. How does control ex ex express itself? Finance, trade credit and other forms of finance, technology, the flow of profits, um, and so on. This is a very different type of status to the Ford this type of status. It's, it's a type of status that depends on uh, contract itself. Uh, it has severe implications for labor to which I will come in a minute. The other part of this, global production networks, of course, is um, global finance. I will just mention it. I will come to it um, uh, uh, in a minute. It isn't quite the same, and I don't particularly want to spend too much time on it. Now let's come to labor, which is the issue here. I, I hope I'm not becoming too analytical, but your book made me think deeply about these issues. So um, let me, let's come to labor now. Labor is crucial into these um, global production networks based on contract. It allows for access to labor across the world on, for, for lower con on lower wages, for lower wage uh, um, countries, but it also allows for the acquisition of the labor input as services provided, which is, of course, a key part, a uh, key concern of the book. It's a kind of global putting out system. One can think about it as a global putting out system. Um, what does that do? It lowers direct employment. So the large multinationals of today, the, 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 lead, the lead firms today have, have got lower uh, direct employment. It allows for control of, over workers through mobility. Contract allows for that through, through mobility of capital. The gig economy is the epitome of this. The gig economy is clearly the epitome of this um, mechanism. It also separates more strongly the service sector from the manufacturing sector. So the hiring of um, lab labor services through contract, in effect, splits, splits manufacturing and makes it appear as different to what it is. And the services associated with manufacturing, integrally associated with man manufacturing, appear as a separate sector now. Um, the input here is that these are provided through contract. And they appear to be not the wage relationship, but the contractual relationship um, by entrepreneurs. The, um, the, the, the units as attached to this articulated network appear as business units, even if they are not. Are property rights important to it? Are fundamental to it. Property rights are fundamental to it. Um, they're fundamental to it because the units that are attached through contract and provide the labor services often do not own very much more than their ability to work, than their ability to deliver the services. In effect, it's the, it's the wage relationship, but it appears differently. The units that command 
what form the contract takes and therefore shape the relationship uh, between the um, those who provide the services and those who buy them are the units that own the core of the production network. What's crucial here, what makes it complicated and much more interesting than before, than before this time, is that these property rights are themselves disarticulated. The more that the global network becomes articulated, articulates different circuits, the more the production, the property rights become disarticulated. That's, that's what makes it difficult to put your finger on. Who owns the multinational at the core of it, the lead multinational? Well, you tell me who owns it. I've tried many times to find who find out who owns what, and it's impossible to find out who owns what because the property rights become broken up. Bring in global finance, which I mentioned to begin with, which is the other side of the pair, and what you get is an impossible to decipher labyrinth of property rights in which labor and those who provide the services often might have property rights over the, over the system that employs them. Now, crucial feature of this is that as he has become disarticulated, he has also become more concentrated than ever before. Bring in the, um, the, the, the mutual funds and the investment funds that dominate the, 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 the financial side, and the concentration of property rights today is without precedent. The last figures I've seen, and I'm sure you've seen them too, is that in the United States, by the end of this decade, possibly 50% of total equity would be in the hands of three investment funds. Now, what are the implications of this? What does democracy mean in that context? How, what is democracy uh, uh, um, at work? I mean, how? And how does the state come into it? And these are huge questions. I haven't got time to answer them, obviously. But it's obvious that we're talking about something which is enormously complex, and far more complex than the time, uh, even of the Fordist period and so on. I want to make two points here, and I'll stop because I've nearly spoken for 15 minutes or so. First is that the state is crucial, as the book points out. The state is crucial to this. The state makes um, the environment through which democracy can or cannot uh, uh, make an appearance in this. But the state note in the contemporary Western world dominated by these forms of uh, enterprise, by these statuses, it doesn't have direct property rights itself over production. And that's what makes it different, different to before. In the Fordist times, it would have direct property rights over production. It doesn't today. Its power doesn't come from that. It comes from controlling money and from controlling finance through money. Um, there's a huge issue, and I don't want to go over it because I haven't got the time. What does it mean for democracy, well, given the power of the state? I'll leave you with some normative points and some conclusions and a little bit of experience from the Amazon um, uh, warehouse strikes, which are in the book, which I experienced firsthand when I was in the States last year. Um, and a little bit of personal experience here might give some texture. In this context, obviously democracy is fundamental. Labor, uh, democracy at work, labor democracy is fundamental. Collective bargaining is key for the reasons that we've just uh, outlined, the, the disparity of power and the differences in status. Law must substantiate collective bargaining. There is no collective bargaining without law, really. Law is necessary for collective bargaining. The book makes that very clear. But collective action is the foundation of collective bargaining. <laughs> without collective action, there is no collective bargaining, really. Collective bargaining must be supported by collective action. And the difficulty starts here in this structure that I've outlined. What kind of collective action? When labor looks like that, when capital looks like that, what kind of collective action? How to go to, to deliver collective action that will allow for collective bargaining, that will allow for democracy, that will change the balance between capital and labor. The Amazon strike is very important because the problems are enormous. The Amazon strike is very important because it gives you, in a nutshell, the reality in this 
roughly outlined um, picture that I presented to you. Amazon work is at Staten Island, struck for a period of time and they won, they were unionized. Whether that's finally unionized or not, it's a different story, but anyway, they won the first victory. What was the major problems they faced? Obviously control by capital over these, over their conditions because of the reasons that I've outlined. This is highly mobile, it's distant, and it can use new technology to control um, the workplace. That wasn't the main problem though. And I'm telling you this from talking to these people and being there, that wasn't the main problem. They, they can always find ways of dealing with it. The real problem was different and it reflects the, the transformation in the, in, in the status that I outlined before. The real problem was lack of memory of their own action. Why? Because in this situation, the turnover of labor is incredibly rapid. So if the turnover of labor is, if, if, the, if, the, if the labor force is entirely renewed within four or five or six months, then there is no memory of, of your own action, your own action. You don't remember what happened six months ago collectively, it doesn't exist. Moreover, what also takes place is um, lack of duration of relations, if, if, which is related to the lack of memory. In other words, uh, you, you don't spend long enough there with other people to, to develop the relations that you need in order to have the collective action and therefore to support the collective bargaining. These two ca characteristics are fundamental because to me, they indicate how labor has been transformed through the uh, outline I, of relations I gave you before. It, it, they're across the board, you find them across the board. And they tell you something about the weakness of the labor side <laughs> when it deals with capital and the absence of property rights. In the absence of property rights and commanding property rights, that's what happens to labor. It forgets, it doesn't, it hasn't got the capacity to retain the memory of its own uh, action and that's crucial for how it responds to capital. The last point that became very clear at, at Amazon, and with this I will finish, is probably the most important point though. And it has to do again with the transformation of how labor operates in these conditions. And it is to do with the original point of the book, which is we are working at the intersection of law and political economy. The ignorance of political economy among Amazon people was astounding. In other words, basic principles of political, political economy, which the generation of their fathers and mothers and forefathers would have had, it was, they just didn't know. They just didn't know, they just didn't have. Except that within the Amazon um, warehouses, there were embedded uh, people, activists, political activists, often in covered ways because they would have been kicked out if anybody knew about them, who carried the memory who carried the memory and who taught them how to organize. The key reason why Amazon work succeeded is because there were these activists there who, taught, who, who told them that this is what happened 50 years ago and 100 years ago, and this is what you do if you're to confront capital in these conditions, and that's what happened. <laughs> the memory, therefore, that is necessary in order to get democracy at work um, must be rescued uh, in these peculiar uh, hidden ways. And in this respect, this book serves its purpose. And so I was really pleased to read it and talk about it. Thank you very much. So um, I think that um, it shouldn't be a surprise that this is um, a really exciting collaboration between, between two exceptional scholars. And I thought about what I could possibly say in relation to um, an outstanding piece of work that is going to be profoundly influential, I think, in labor law scholarship, certainly, and probably beyond that. But I, I thought that perhaps what I could do is highlight what I see as the really important contributions of this book, and then to go on to perhaps extrapolate from that. And this is a book which really looks at labor law and the labor constitution predominantly at the national level and in a comparative sense as well, dealing with the UK, uh, Germany, also the US and some other countries. But I'm curious about whether we can transpose some of the lessons in this book uh, 
to the global regulatory level, which is the area in which I predominantly research. And as I was saying to Ruth just before, I have uh, started treating um, this book a little bit like a Bible um, and quoting it um, uncritically. So what I want to do, I suppose, is talk about some of um, the ideas in the book and the lessons that can be learned and to just check with the authors whether the ways in which I want to use those lessons make sense to them. Um, so, go ahead. So, in terms of what I think the important contributions of the book are, they are many and various, and this is probably an oversimplification. You have to go and read the book for yourself, obviously, but I think there were four um, real, uh, really helpful aspects of this book in terms of my own thinking and research, and probably for many of us. So I suppose the first contribution, as Mike said, is historical. Um, so the book tracks state-managed capitalism of the 20th century to um, neoliberalism, which is dominant in the 21st century, and thinks about how labor law can act as a form of counter-movement, but not just um, labor law as it's often understood. The book also makes a conceptual contribution to our understanding of the complex interaction between contract and status in the so-called labor market, although obviously that market is constructed by law and other social norms. Um, and I think it gives us a view in this context of how contract and status plays into labor law, but also a wider labor constitution drawing on Ruth's earlier work. It's a really important book empirically as well, because it identifies four case studies of workers demonstrating the failures of liberalization as emancipation. So it tackles gig workers, the Amazon warehouse workers who Costas was referring to earlier, care workers, and I know Lydia is going to speak further on that. And I suppose what I found um, really interesting and telling was the discussion of university professors and the ways in which we have been converted into entrepreneurs and competitors in ways that are not healthy. And you know, obviously you can see that coming out at the moment in the context of the UCU strikes, which are part of the wave of strikes that Mike was mentioning earlier. What I enjoyed, I suppose, is that the book ends on quite a hopeful note, um, considering all the challenges that we're faced with at the moment. And there are two uh, normative contributions. One is the discussion of a role that can be played by occupational communities from the ground up, um, which is also the subject of your longer article in the journal Law and Society, but also a discussion of how we might understand labor constitutions and their operation. And I thoroughly enjoyed the treatment of the right to strike at the end. And, and that's what I'm gonna come back to shortly. Yep. So if we're going to try to transpose this to uh, the global regulatory level, how might we do that? Well, one of the features of the book is its exploration of the aspects of industrial citizenship in state-managed capitalism in the post-war period and what is described as a form of um, public status and um, the way in which this is eroded. So here I'm going to quote from page 133 of the book. So it said that in the transition from the era of industrial citizenship to the neoliberalism of today, what has been lost is above all the public nature of the status of the worker politically constructed and unitary, defining a floor of rights and collective capacities, overlaying, overriding, neutralizing class and socially based descriptive status as well as employer designed status contracts. And in a sense, what it said we have lost um, is that, that capacity for uh, public regulation that recognizes the concerns of the workers as legitimate. And, and give some space, I think, for the kind of conflict that was described earlier. Instead, what we have is status as a form of stigma through contract, 
So the ability to describe someone as an independent contractor so that they can't claim any of the public rights they might as an employer, as a worker, um, you know, in terms of their immigration status and the way in which that has been used within the labor market as well, and, and just evasion of any of the status that might be applicable. So can we extrapolate from that kind of analysis anything at the global level regarding labor constitutions and here I'm thinking about um, the description of labor constitutions, their definition as an ensemble of rules, institutions, social statuses, and economic and technical technological conditions. I think that um, the treatment at the end of the book of occupational communities draws us down to the local and the immediate levels, but I think there are multiple levels at which we might want to think about this. So at the national, at the, at the regional, and even at the international, at the global. And that's where I wanted to pose some questions, I suppose. So for those of you who may not know, the International Labour Organization now has a new director general. And this is Gilbert F. Holbo. And he is a really interesting person, actually. He is a Togolese national. He was the prime minister of Togo from 2008 to 2012, so in the process of the financial crisis. He has impeccable credentials in a sense because he comes through the UNDP and he was at the head of um, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, so very development oriented. But he is also someone who did his postgraduate training in Canada he worked for Price Waterhouse in Canada and um, is a member of the Canadian Institute of Chartered Accountants. So he's an interesting blend of the financialized and the development. And what he has suggested is that he wants to pursue the idea of a new social contract, which has been put forward by the UN Secretary General. And he wants to do so in a way that is reliant on founding values of the ILO, peace, social justice, equitable economic growth and solidarity while respecting and protecting the environment. And this is going to be a global coalition for social justice. Now, I think there's a really interesting interplay in the, in the book um, from the authors of this desire to create a form of social peace through social justice and the difficult tensions that arise around that. Um, there is a document, a preliminary document, which was made available to the governing body in October, November, which presents this new vision of a social contract. And I, I wonder whether this is a form of industrial citizenship or whether it's something else. It makes very interesting reading and there will be a report um, that I've discussed informally with ILO officials that is going to be forthcoming at um, the next International Labour Conference. So this is all kind of on the cards and possibly influential. Could this vision of social contract reflect the, bo the book's treatment of democracy at work? In some ways it, it may do because the document is very clear that the International Labour Organization is planning to be inclusive in terms of a treatment of the world of work. So it is clear that this will include the formal and the informal sector um, that comes out of the 2008 ILO declaration, also convention number 190 on violence and harassment at work and its notion that you can have this broader world of work. So in that sense, it responds to some of the concerns in the book. There is also going to be some kind of link with international financial institutions, the IMF and the World Bank, and to be embedded in trade in terms of the World Trade Organization. And there, I mean, I wonder if that is possible in a sense because the WTO is in some ways neutered by the failure of, of, of you know, it no longer has an appellate body that's working as an institution. And the IMF and World Bank may not be where the real power is at the moment globally in terms of where, um, and I'd be very interested in your views on that, where financialization really lies. Um, what I thought I might talk about is a little bit about what might be meant by tripartism and social dialogue in this context. Um, this brings us back to that issue of conflict um, and this desire for, you know, a social contract, I suppose, just to quote you from earlier, to um, 
to think about normative unity and your point that democracy has to open up space for conflict. I'm not convinced that the international labor organizations view of social dialogue and tripartism is really open to conflict at the moment and recognition of a right to strike. So I think that um, the book is, is, is telling because it points to the fact that democracy at work requires power and leverage in voice. It talks about the importance of conflict facilitation in addition to conflict adjudication. Since the employer workout, walkout from the Conference Committee on the Application of Standards in 2012, the ILO has really just evaded the issue of the right to strike repeatedly. So although that was officially resolved in 2015, there are still issues with the powers of ILO supervisory bodies to make pronouncements on the right to strike. Um, and although there is capacity for meaningful solidarity, certainly solidarity with civil society representing so-called atypical workers. So you could see the importance of NGOs in the context of say the Convention on Domestic Work. In reality, I'm not convinced that mere solidarity with civil society organizations and even work with social movements is going to be enough. I think there is something quite peculiar about labor, um, the way in which people are treated at work and the impact on their lives and dignity. And I also think that there's something quite peculiar and important about the way that labor can collectively exercise power when that labor is withdrawn. Um, and to forget that or to sideline it is deeply dangerous. So I think because democracy is a multi-level process, the ILO can be relevant here and there needs to be a restatement of the importance of a right to strike in order to make any kind of social contract meaningful for democracy at work. So um, there's a really nice treatment in the book. Am I going on too long, Mike? Can I keep on going just for a little bit? You have a couple of minutes, yeah. Okay, so at page 137 of the book, um, there is a really important statement for me about um, the ways in which strikes occur that they occur when there's a violation of the fundamental beliefs of workers concerning a fair balance of wage and effort or a fair adjustment of the terms of existing contracts to changing economic and technological circumstances. That workers tend to go on strike only when they feel that deeply held ideas of justice are disregarded. And I think there's been a wave of that in the UK recently. Um, but also that labor conflicts are moral conflicts as much as economic ones. Um, so the book points to the ways in which we might redesign labor laws and a labor constitution at national level to think about how constraints on how work is organized in order to generate um, collective solidarity and, and collective action. And I do think that the ILO could help with that. Extending the world of work will certainly help with that. Extending forms of regulation and it is important, I think, that the ILO is now, has now just agreed at the governing body in the last week that there will be an attempt to um, launch a convention on platform work. And they have a draft convention in play. I think Valerio de Stefano has been involved in the preliminary drafting of that with the ITUC. And um, we're likely to see a vote on that in 2025. So that's all good news. What is more problematic is this outstanding issue of the right to strike. So at the governing body again in March, there was a discussion of how the issue of the right to strike could be referred to the International Court of Justice to get legal certainty. Now that's a dangerous and risky strategy, but it's a strategy to get some certainty. Um, there were developments, the International Labour Office produced a document which was not about the right to strike, but about the procedures for referring things to the International Court of Justice. And that has been put to one side. I think we're likely to see more activity on this. So I would watch that space. Um, but I'd also like to say that I do think there is scope here to redefine and readjust our understandings of the right to strike. So the ITUC and the Solidarity Center are launching a new project in which the University of Bristol and the Center for Law at Work, in which Manoj and I are in, involved, 
will be um, will be leading on the academic side. Ruth is going to be part of that project. So I think you know there are there are developments afoot, and I do think that this book is going to be an inspiration for some of that. So thank you very much. Thanks, Tanya. All right. It's a real honor to be here to speak about this book, this wonderful book by these distinguished authors and among these uh, distinguished colleagues. I'm going to begin with a story that I heard on, of all places, the BBC Food Program. And hopefully, get over to my next slide here. Uh, click has stopped again. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Uh, there we go. That'll do the trick. Um, so here's my story. It turns out that uh, three hours north of Glasgow, there is a whiskey distillery called the Glen Parkless Distillery. It's been there a long time uh, since, I think, 1863. And for the last 50 years or so, it has had a visitor center where you can go and uh, try their whiskey and marvel at bottles that were laid down before you were born and you know, the sort of things you would do at a distillery visitor center. And it's located in this little town or village of uh, six houses. And for 50 years or so, it plied its trade in peace until the summer of last year, somebody drilled out the locks, broke into their whiskey, their cabinet, the, the family casks, uh, their most precious whiskeys, made off with 150,000 pounds worth of whiskey and you might ask what happened 50 years no problem and then suddenly somebody breaks in well what happened is actually not mysterious at all whiskey had become an asset class uh the people are being encouraged to uh recession proof their portfolio by investing in whiskey now in glossy brochures there are people out there conduct uh constructing indices of whiskey prices so you can see what happened to whiskey prices in the last uh decade or so before before this break in people are out there trying to create the average opinion of the average opinion on the price price of whiskey and, and turn it into an asset class and in those uh, sets of circumstances, it made sense to make that three hour drive, figure out how to uh, drill out the locks and make off with 150,000 pounds worth of whiskey. So, you know, if we take this simple story and just make it a story about adherence to law, people, why might people adhere to law? Well, they might adhere to law because they think stealing is a bad thing, so norms. They might look at the content of the law that says, don't do this or you will be punished, and so they might adhere to the law for that reason, and they might adhere to the law because of economic incentives. I drive all the way up there, I drill out the lock, I get this whiskey, it's not worth very much, why bother? But if something is happening on broader markets, suddenly the incentives on whether or not you would adhere to law change. So the distillery visitor center is going on about its business, but the broader world is changing in ways that radically change its relationship to law. Now this is a really, so the, just my next uh, slide emphasizes that the economic incentives can really change things. This is a straightforward, even boneheaded approach to law, right? People are going to try harder to steal stuff if it's more valuable. The way that people behave with respect to law responds, at least in some, to some extent, to economic incentives is a, a very straightforward point. But in my own work on law, which was mostly about Russia in the 1990s and early two, 2000s, I over and over again encountered the fact that People would go on and on about how oh, Russia is lawless and it needs to be less corrupt and it needs to enforce its law better and so on, without ever talking about what were the incentives that were making law work so hard or work so badly. And I think if you put that insight into play, it's very straightforward, but it's very powerful. And I think it is one that is quite deeply internalized in this book. I said that I titled this presentation, Labor Law in, in Context, The Wisdom of Democracy at Work. The context among the contexts is changing economic incentives, and wisdom means they say a lot of stuff that I agree with. 
What I'm going to do in the rest of my uh, few minutes here is to try to set out the argument or some of the argument of the book in this kind of very straightforward framework and see if that helps you get into it and, and make a couple of, of points of my own. So the tradition in which, whoops, I have to make sure to move things on both slides. Um, and apologies for stuff being in the way here. Let's see if I can get that out of the way. Um, the problem that labor law is called on to, to solve in this book is a, a classic problem, very brilliantly and famously expressed by Marx, right? That on the one hand, we have this image of the world of contract, of free choice, of very even of the rights of man, in which every agreement represents mutual advantage that everybody involved has freely chosen, but you contrast that world to the, the real world of production and the capitalist enters into the real world of production, uh, intent on business and flirting in a really good mood and the worker enters uh, cringing and hanging back and expecting nothing but uh, a hiding, a beating. It's very hard to translate puns. This is a brilliant translation of the original German pun. So, what Dukes and Strake are saying is that to get to a kind of relationship between capitalism, the capital and labor that isn't experienced as humiliating, isn't experienced as coercive, you need to invest workers with a kind of status that is capable of giving contract a form that permits for industrial justice. So why would employers, why would capitalists accede to such a status? Why would they be willing to accept, whoops, change again the slide. What would explain will, employers' willingness to accept labor status and uh, the obscured thing here? This is important. A seating, an employer has more options than our thief, right? The thief decides in my little story, do I drive up there and steal the whiskey or do I not? In a system of, of private law, it's not just about violating law or not violating law, but how do you make use of law and what laws do you make use of? This was also really important uh, in, in the, the things I was working on in Russia. So, when is it that employers will accede to labor's status of the sort that makes labor not cringe and the capital smirk a little bit less? And when will they tr try to get out of it? And again, we can think about norms and labor uh, law content and enforcement and economic incentives. And as uh, uh, Tony was mentioning also, uh, that uh, collective bargaining, right? Uh, which is another way in which employers can come to see that it's a good idea for them to accede to the, the status of labor. Altogether, define it slightly differently, but this is what uh, Dukes and Strake building on uh, uh, Weimar theorist that I hadn't previously heard of, but sounds like a very interesting one, uh, Hugo uh, Zinsheimer, and also on, on Max Weber, called the, the labor constitution. All of these things, when they're working together, can grant workers a, a status that enables them to have some uh, dignity at work. But if you think about my whiskey store, you see where this is going. What happens if the economic incentives change. So you start from a, an era of industrial citizenship, an era in which workers have the kind of status that Dukes and Strait hope they would have. Why do employers accede to that? Well, they accede to that because of labor law. Sure, they accede to that because of collective bargaining. Sure, but they also accede to that because of economic incentives. The enthusiasm and commitment of workers at work is valuable to them. And putting them in a situation in which they're uh, cringing and feel co coerced is not going to generate that. 
among the things that they cite is it's not possible to write a contract that specifies every contingency. You can't tell a worker what to do in every situation or couldn't uh, get back to that. Uh, so you need the worker to be ready to act on behalf of the, the company, on behalf of the company's best interests in those underspecified circumstances. Employers can see the benefit of, of that too. See, that's one set of economic incentives. But as time passes, the economic situation changes and employers are less willing to accede, to accord that status to workers. They look for ways to bypass that labor constitution. They make use of the opportunities offered to them by private law. So this builds on, on what Tony was saying. Uh, they, uh, Dukes and Strait talk about a shift from public ordering to private ordering of labor relations. And there are many, many ways that employers try to get around classifying their workers as employees. There are also many, many ways now that employers are able to dispense with the enthusiasm and consent of workers and still get them to work. Well, the economic incentive that's changed is that the, the panopticon mechanism is even cheaper than when Foucault described it, right? It's so much easier to monitor workers. It's so much easier to treat people as the counterpart to some entry in a spreadsheet as a stand-in for a robot that will eventually be built to build the same thing. The descriptions in this book of the lives of Amazon warehouse workers are absolutely horrifying, and they make Adam Smith's famous pin factory look like you know, a great job, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's really quite something. So what do uh, Dukes and uh, Strake propose? Let me... They propose that you need to reconstruct law. If employers continue to draft contracts so as to ensure that some workers are not employees, for instance, there's been a lot of battles around whether gig worker economies should, uh, gig, gig economy workers should be classified as employees. If employers keep saying, oh, they're not employees, they're independent contractors and we don't have to pay them benefits or minimum wages and so on and so forth, then we need to, to stop doing that. Just like the law forbids us from selling ourselves into slavery, it ought to forbid us uh, from entering into this kind of a contract. Labor law must react by eliminating the distinction between employment and other forms of dependent work so that the status of employment can be accorded to these categories of workers. Similarly, if there's no technological constraint to treating people like robots, uh, no technological constraint, no economic incentives that make it too costly to organize work in a despotic way, then we need to have law step in and force employers to adapt their mode of operation to the normative standards of decent work that society and law, the law have established. Now, one of the things that I really like about this book is, as I said, that they situate labor law in context, and of course, the context of the economic incentives is still going to push on all of these things, change the laws, and, and employers will still try to get around them. So I was reading a, a bit about this. There's been a continual thing in, in US labor law where some category of independent contractors gets reclassified as employees. The, the courts say, look, these people are all, to all intents and purposes employees. You have to treat them like employees, accord them labor law protections. And the employers will go down the list of standards that the uh, court has set out saying, this is why they're uh, actually an employee and, and figure out how to game the system. Oh, you drive the same route every day and that makes you an employee? Fine, now you have to buy one of these six routes, right? Now you're an entrepreneur. It's, uh, it's this incredible uh, system of gaming and getting around and looking for loopholes and, and so on and so forth. So the economic incentives are there. If you're going to constrain them, you need some sort of economic constitution that is capable of reshaping the environment of incentives that are driving employers 
to work so hard to treat workers so shabbily. Another thing I like about this book, I think it has an excellent reading of Karl Polanyi, whose work has been very important to me. So it's uh, he's talking about the reconstruction of the uh, economy. So um, Karl, to us, labor law that takes its mission seriously cannot be avoid being part of, and that's really important, part of the Polanyian counter movement against the transformation of human labor into a marketable com commodity, a mar counter movement that inevitably concerns not only the market for labor power, but also the other markets with which it communicates. You have to work on those broader markets that are creating the incentives that shape employer behavior. And Polanyi's idea is that the counter movement was more or less spontaneous. And there's some of this in the book too, the idea of uh, also building on what Tony was saying that occupational communities can generate norms, that these norms might serve as something that would channel efforts to constrain employers. Polanyi's idea was that something similar would bubble up through a class structure that each class, even the capitalist class, stood for certain values that were bigger than themselves and that you could expect them to have political success when they were acting in the overall interests of society. Whatever you think about that in the uh, 20s and 30s, I think it's a very hard case to make for today. In the state of California, Uber drivers organized to say, we need to be treated more like employees and have more of, of the protections that you get under labor law and not as independent contractors. And eventually the state legislature passed a law saying, yeah, you're right about that, we'll, we'll do that. Uber and the other gig economy, platform economy companies reacted to that by launching a ballot initiative, which is pretty easy to do in California, to create a special status for their employees where they didn't have to give them labor protections. They spent $200 million pushing that campaign. And I tried to work it out and it's, that's probably somewhere between a hundred and a thousand dollars per employee uh, that would have been affected by that. So $200 million sounds like a lot, but even if it's $1,000 per employee and labor protections cost $3 a day, they make it back in a year, right? So the power of these economic incentives is really, really intense. Just like the distillery needs a really gnarly lock now and a great surveillance system, labor needs something much more powerful than it's been able to bring to the table so far if it's going to redress these things. I think the capacity of the book to put labor law in context really makes this an excellent guide to trying to understand our current moment. Thanks, I'll stop there. Thanks very much, David. And we, we did start late, which means I think we can have one round of questions. We will have a, uh, another chance to have questions in the second half, but I don't want to... I don't want to uh, deprive you of your right to ask a question on this occasion. So we'll have one quick round of questions. Please keep your questions quick because coffee is uh, on its way as we speak. So, um, Vincent, yeah. Speak, make sure you speak up so we can. Yeah. You... Uh, but at this point, it's more about how far it seems that is it quite white based. Uh, this approach, i.e., we need more regulation and sort of rights for the workers. Um, we need to recognize money in those animals, we need to give back that workers are employees and things like that. But I was wondering what you think about uh, about the necessity of having more black workers uh, with workers who work in us, not more than that, or i.e., we need to uh, give workers. Uh, the capacity to build all things like that. Um, this, in, in the understanding that sometimes we do have rights for workers, but of course, we're forcing the rights for things. Um, I was wondering what to think of that. Thanks, thanks, thanks very much. I should have introduced Vincent as a, as a PhD student of mine and Leia's in the government department. 
Um, any any other we'll take we'll take any other questions and then we'll 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 let Wolfgang and Ruth have a have a, a, a quick response before we go. Any 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 takers or um, we can we can do another we're going to do another round of questions later anyway, so you can come back. Um, but um, do you want to just take that take that question and then we will have a coffee break. Uh, thank you, Vincent. Yes, just very briefly, I think um, there isn't much in the book. There's very little detail on the kind of question of uh, law reform. Um, what we do emphasize is the need for a, a reimagined and expanded right to freedom of association. So that's the particular right that workers need. Nothing original about that argument, of course, but the point we make is that freedom of association is uh, fundamental in creating spaces for worker solidarity to grow. So along the lines of this. I, I can only underline this and say that uh, this is a theory of conflict and not of regulation or of regulation coming out of conflict with the possibility that uh, regulation is not really um, put into place uh, or, or obeyed, uh, which is the point where you need uh, a, a myriad of, uh, of uh, small uh, platforms for people to organize. In enforcement of labor law is an incredibly interesting subject. Ruth is sort of beginning to, to work on this, if I may say that. It's incredibly exciting because you have a general rule and then you have all these many, many workplaces. How do you police the, the rule being actually applied? And the only way you can have this is by sort of countervailing power policing. You have to give rights to people who are affected by, uh, by, by rules, who should be benefited by them, to actually go someplace and get their right for them. And going someplace will very often mean your own action. Yeah, in, in that sense, what, what, what I see here in terms of the theory of regulation of, 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 of the working life is the idea of a, a vast number of possibilities of people in these different places in the economy to make themselves heard, to communicate with each other, to, to, to build a consensus that what is happening to them is not right in terms of industrial justice, and then we do something about it. So this is Lydia Hayes for the University of Liverpool. I've met a few times before, and uh, but particularly admired all her work uh, in relation to care workers who are at the bottom of the heap. Uh, but I look forward to hear what you have to say about this. Thank you, Hugh. And I've also got some pictures of vegetables as well. <laughs> um, thank you for inviting me to talk. Um, I love the book. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. It's really smart the way that it has been put together. It not only offers a view of labor law and political economy, which reminds us of how deeply historically and culturally embedded the factors that labor law attempts to regulate are. It reminds us of the significance of intellectual and academic thought, of labor law scholarship, which is socially embedded and based on empirical research, but also about the humanity of labor. And that for me is the really distinctive part and, and approach of this book and um, how it has made me think a little differently about my own work. So um, one of the case studies in the book is based on work that I did a few years ago with care workers. And it's really interesting for me to look at how you have taken that work and to know how the women I interviewed, how they would think about the way in which you recognized their agency and the way in which they understood their situated position. And I think that that's quite unusual in, in a book that, that you have managed to achieve that. So it's, it's very impressive. Here's the vegetables. Right, food for thought. 
So how is this book food for thought? Well, it clearly begins with the idea that labour law is unfit for its original and its defining purpose of protecting workers from unfair and unequal treatment, decent work and a decent standard of living. It also then knits it together with an analysis of the significance of labour law for democracy. So looking at the significance of labour law for supporting a second tier of democracy at workplace and community level, which gives legitimacy to a first tier of government. And isn't it interesting to think, well, it is for me anyway, to think about what has been done in terms of the erosion of that second tier of democracy over many years and the state of our first tier of democracy at the current time. It also provides a really interesting analysis of status to contract and contract to status, giving a interpretation and a credibility to the analysis both of status and of contract, yet at the same time as saying neither of these are satisfactory as either or or movements from one to the other because they are both interdependent and embedded. Now, for me, the analysis of status is particularly interesting, looked at from the perspective of care workers, because the book recognizes that the fact that status, the protection of status, has not been attainable for many workers, has actually given rise to forms of explicit rejection of those workers as not acquiring or deserving or occupying a social place in which they have status. And therefore it pushes them to contract as a form of emancipation. I think that's really smart and I really appreciate your analysis and the way that you have captured that, that the idea that both we, we often in labor law will talk about the way in which contract is fictitious. Contract is based upon ideas of the promise of liberation, the promise of equity and equality. We don't so often talk about status as an ideal in that way too, that status is also fictitious and a, a promise. The other thing that the book does really well, although I don't think you express it like this, but this is what it meant to me, was it spoke to me about the dignity of labor. And it spoke to me about the way in which workers create their own narratives of dignity. That through the analysis of occupational identity and occupational solidarity, workers will find dignity in the work that they do. That the dignity of labor is not only something that we can look at and say it's comprised of 12 elements or whatever it is that, that we intend to do, that actually lived and situated as a matter of justice, as something which maybe is pragmatic, that worker dignity is something that workers go out and find because workers make meaning from their work. Yeah. And that's aspirational. And that drive for dignity is what we can hang ideas of the hope of democracy upon, I think. I also really enjoyed the similarities in the accounts of emancipation and meaning making between care workers and professors. You know, that's really unusual to see in a book that um, both occupations were being required to find their own way 
to show what they could do in terms of the marketization and commercialization of their talent and capacities, and that there were remarkable similar uh, experiences between care workers and professors, which speaks to this idea about making human dignity, about workers making meaning of their work. And I also really appreciated the account of occupational community as a site of solidarity, a way of building collective identity, interests and bargaining. And I do have a question for you, which, which is a little bit about how we might connect the kind of strength of this recognition of the significance of occupational identity with sectoral bargaining, because I'm not sure that they are the same things. Do workers actually recognize themselves and make meaning from themselves as being part of a sector or as part of an occupation? Um, anyway, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, care workers and about some thoughts and ideas about where my work is going and how it connects to some of the accounts in, in, in this book. Um, and maybe speak to a little bit about why, in terms of democracy at work, why, where, where are we? Um, so care workers have been in a situation where their push towards status as formally incorporated workers within the labor market, their status is kind of failed. They haven't been able to achieve pay equity from the point of view of working in a way where their contracted terms are free from sex discrimination, which is why it has um, been so financially advantageous for them to become privatized so that their rights to equal pay become basically ineffective. They have also failed around even minimum wage. So if we look at cases like uh, Mencap and Tomlinson Blake, for example, we see that the status of care workers is one in which they are not even recognized to be fully working for the purposes of minimum wage. So it suggests that their occupational status, seen through the eyes of the law, their occupational status is stronger than their worker status. And I describe this in my book as being a form of institutionalized humiliation, that that exclusion of care workers, although there are other workers in this situation too, but that exclusion of care workers from status was about the humiliation of that workforce. And as I'm going to go on, there are consequences that I believe are have arisen and, and are continuing to arise from that. In Dukes and uh, Streak's terms, there has been this push in care work for contract to be a form of liberation. So for the from privatization to individualization, to personalization, to fragmentation as liberation for workers. And I also really appreciate the deeply historical and socially embedded way in which this book talks about status as a form of paternalistic dependency. And we do need to recall that there is a that historically, when we talk about wage labor, we need to recognize that workers need care, that there is a caregiving function, which is part of this picture too, and needs to be accounted for in any form of rethinking around workplace democracy. So as my work talked about, I talked about the political contempt that there has been for care workers, the way that there has been a disregard of the evidence of the consequences of their poor terms and conditions and a refusal of the state to accept responsibility for care. I've also been aware for quite a while that I would like to write more 
about the way in which when I have interviewed care workers, when I have talked to them about injustice at work, that they have expressed injustice in ways in which they talk about the impact on themselves, on their body. They talk about feeling worthless, about situations in which they are controlled or abused as being linked to having low wages, that they talk about the insecurity of their contracting and not having a timetable as being about being left to walk around in the dark at night and feeling very vulnerable. So there's this sense in which they express this idea that the sense of worthlessness of their status is something that they experience physically. They map it onto their body. And I think that that's quite an interesting way for us to think about labor law and injustice as uh, on us as human beings, as what does this physically do to us? And this has been clearly a theme and a thread which has arisen through much scholarship in relation to COVID. So, um, just to sort of note um, Hendy and Ewing's piece about COVID-19 and the failure of labour law, they talked about serious and systemic failures of labour law, and they said in 2020, due to what was happening in relation to personal protective equipment and COVID and all the things that we, we know about that have unfolded, that it was clear that the future of labour law is about to be hotly contested, hence very timely for the book in that case. Um, and the pandemic in the UK revealing the powerlessness of the modern state, unable or unwilling to protect its residents. And of course, the book reminds us the state is ever present. This is always a matter of political choice and political design. So the failure of the state to care for its citizens, a state that undervalues care, this is a problem which has proven contagious. We have reducing life expectancy in the UK, and indeed the front page of the Financial Times today actually profiles how this is also evident in the United States too, Britain and the United States. We know about the unnecessary deaths due to COVID, which were about the failure to care. We know about long COVID, which is experienced within particular occupational sectors who were exposed to COVID because of a failure to meet their care needs as human workers. We have a health crisis. Our health crisis, yes, it's about the fact that people can't get operations. Why can't they get operations? They can't get operations because we don't have enough care workers because we have so many people who can't be cared for in the community. That's why we have a health crisis. It's connected to this lack of valuing, lack of recognition of the centrality of care and the responsibility of the state in contemporary democracy to provide security to its citizens. Old Leviathan needs to do a bit of caring. Um, so we have insufficient workers, and we also have an epidemic of disability. More people claiming personal independence payments than ever before. This uh, little graph is um, the number of people on waiting lists in England continuing to break records. So we have 7 million people waiting for operations and care in England. These people not only are dropping out of the workforce, they are people that also need to be cared for while they are not getting the treatment that they need. You can see here, this is a picture of life expectancy. Life expectancy, as you can see, well, if we went back to the sort of beverage 1942, Sort of since then, there's been this lovely upward trajectory of social progress. And then we hit the financial crisis, 2010, 
and austerity and look the materiality the effect on the body the fact that we are human look at what has happened to our longevity this is before covid this graph ends at 2018 obviously after covid it takes a bit of a dive since then um, but it's important to show you that this is pre-covid the life expectancy issues are not to do with covid if health has stopped improving it suggests that society has stopped improving um health expectancy healthy life expectancy has declined mortality rates have increased in the thank goodness I'm just outside it now, 45 to 49 age group, um, which is likely to do with economic and social conditions. And the more deprived the geographic area, the shorter people's life expectancy. And it is in the decade prior to the pandemic that has been marked by deteriorating health and widening health inequalities and by a severe deterioration in the quality of work. What is good quality work? This about good quality work comes from evidence from public health. This is from Michael Marmot's work and from Health England. And look, voice and representation. It is part of being healthy as a human being in a work situation is recognized to be protective of one's health. We are now facing the consequences of a health crisis in the UK <laughs> workforce. And the point is this for capital. We don't have enough workers. So this, this line, you can see it plummets during the pandemic because there were fewer jobs and, and there were people who were furloughed. But look at how massively it has increased in terms of the number of vacancies. The number of vacancies has risen because we have too few workers. We have too many workers who are ill, too many workers who are having to provide care. And you can see that this is across all age groups. So the first group there is uh, 16 to 24 year olds. You can see how many of them are sick. 234,000 workers under 24 who are sick. That is why they cannot work. Obviously we then move into the age group just below 50. And we see that we have a million workers more or less who are sick and over a million who are caring. Where have all the workers gone? This is in large part where they are. Working conditions are not keeping people healthy. Our state is not looking after people's care needs. So it reminds me of a contribution by a political theorist, Joan Tronto, called Caring Democracy, where she basically argues that care is a prerequisite of human freedom. Care is a prerequisite of being able to contract effectively. Care is a prerequisite of being able to participate and engage in workplace democracy. So what happens if we start to think about labor law as for the protection of public health? What forms of law would that require? Perhaps forms of law that I maybe previously have thought are really not very good, things like the right to request. Well, actually, if we think about this from the point of view of agency and health and voice, maybe the right to request is really useful. The right to be able to choose a form of contract the right to adaptation in relation to disability. Clearly, the right to engage in collective representation and bargaining for your occupational community. Not sure what that means for sexual bargaining, but um, maybe we could discuss that. So I think that there are many potential 
political and legal possibilities that arise from us thinking about the role of labor law and workplace democracy for the protection of public health as something which is in the national interest and also in our personal interest, in our economic interest and in our democratic interest. Thank you. Our last speaker uh, this afternoon, I've tried to keep us going so that there'll be time for questions and comments and maybe even give a right of reply. Now that's, uh, 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 is Richard Hyman, who uh, is very distinguished, a professor of industrial relations. Uh, when I was starting out studying labor law, his books were the uh, the must go to books, particularly uh, the well, I think was it Marxism and industrial relations. That was my favorite. Anyway, um, still that's just very long alive. That's a very long time ago. That's nineteen seventies, <laughs> I think, when uh, we last used to have national strikes. Anyway, Richard, go on. Right. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you from others. Uh, to Ruth and Wolfgang uh, for their book and for the invitation to be here today. Um, <clears throat> what we've got in the book, and many people have read it and others will, is among other things a very powerful analysis of the growth of authoritarianism often new forms of authoritarianism at work and of new forms of degradation of workers. And another very important uh, aspect is we have an eloquent manifesto, one might say, for democracy and justice at work. What I want to talk about in my what I hope will be a very brief uh, presentation is uh, what we might call the one possible element in shaping uh, a Polanyan counter movement. And in particular, I've got three short slides. The first looks at the problem of ambiguities in the whole notion of democracy at work. Secondly, the problem that, to an important extent, in much of everyday life, authoritarian control of workers by either visible employers or by far less visible uh, entities of capital is accepted as normal. So the question of changing understanding of normality has to be part of the process. And third, we've already heard about this from Hannah, um, the possible role of trade unions in this, this process. So first of all, the ambiguities and much of the discourse of um, democracy, justice, voice, decent work. Um, in the main, people don't stand up and say democracy is a bad thing, whether in the polity or in employment so often they redefine what it means. The whole concept of democracy is often used tendentiously and mendaciously. There's a lot, hang on. <laughs> yeah, maybe I've been pushing the wrong button. Um, Oh, that's okay. That's good. Yeah, that's good. Right. I mean, there's a. I remember probably half a century ago almost, there was a very popular. It was uh, sort of objecting when I had this mic too close. That seems to have. I should not stand too close to it, perhaps. 
Uh, I remember a book probably half a century ago called Industrial Democracy, The Sociology of Participation. Um, Wolfgang is also old enough to have read this. Um, and the whole idea that democracy and participation can be simply equated uh, is ridiculous if it's not so wasn't so dangerous. Um, the various forms of terminology which are used come from very different discourses, have very different implications, very different meanings. What seems obvious to me, and I think it comes through very clearly in the book, is that if we're to mean anything by workplace democracy, we have to be subversive. Democratization implies radical transformation. It isn't something which can simply be cosmetic. It isn't uh, a sort of sticking plaster to make workers feel better. And to go back to the familiar point for labor lawyers, um, the employment contract is a license to command. Authoritarianism is hardwired into capitalist labor relations. Then what I call the suffocating weight of normality. One of the outcomes, almost one of the indices of power imbalances is the capacity to shape conceptions of what is possible and what is desirable, and hence what is normal and what is abnormal. And any struggle for democracy at work has to be in part a challenge to what one might call normal conceptions of normality. If uh, democracy at work is to be a feasible political project, then we have to show how it is both possible and desirable. Um, it's not just a debate for the academic sphere, it's one which has to be part of public discourse. And so I say here, it requires both utopian imagination and strategic vision. And at the same time, it's not uh, just a question of cathedral socialism. Um, our analyses and understandings and arguments have to connect with experiences of everyday life. We have to be part of this process which we heard about just now of building. a vision, a sense of worth, a sense of capacity out of one's day-to-day -day experiences in work. And this means, I think, nothing less than a liberation struggle, uh, which in some cir circumstances and some quarters will be as unpopular as other forms of liberation struggle always are until they win, perhaps. And the final point, and it's, I think, a fairly straightforward one. And as someone who's spent almost all my uh, academic career, uh, as a student of trade unions and to some extent as a trade unionist myself, um, I approach this without any illusions 
about trade unions and what trade unions are, what is sometimes done in their name, and what is their capacity for change. But first of all, the point, and we've already heard this, democracy at work has to be multi-level. Um, we have to find ways of linking the workplace, the national environment, and the transnational. And this is an immense challenge. And trade unions are one of the few actors with at least potential capacity to engage with this multi-level challenge. But if unions are to change the world, and this is something I've been arguing for very long, unions have to change themselves. They have a new have to develop a new vision, or at least a new conception of what might be an old vision. And they have to develop new forms of activism. They have to build new alliances. They have to look for new vocabularies, new discourses, um, and not simply rely on the rhetoric of the 19th century, um, which few people these days comprehend. And they themselves have to be patently de democratic. And this means building new modes of internal democracy. And this is a radical ch challenge, but as the old slogan goes, uh, be realistic, demand the impossible. And it seems to me in many ways, what this book does is to just suggest how we might demand the impossible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we have a few minutes uh, for questions, I think. The reason I'm looking at my phone is the only thing that seems to be reliable on time, um, not because I'm getting lots of texts or anything like that, nothing exciting. Yes, yes. But you can ask the panel, or I guess you can ask us about the authors as well. Yes. Uh, I wish the sociologist about years of and philosophy. And in my PhD days, what I wanted to say was the Was this switched on? What was uh, incredibly valuable. Uh, so I'm delighted to see you come back to this topic, and uh, I look forward to reading it. So I haven't read it, uh, <coughs> but in in the two things, two comments I want to make. One is. What does this book offer with regard to major change in employment relations? That is the individualization of employment relations, that you're more likely to have conflict now in the workplace on an individual basis that goes to an employment tribunal rather than to a strike, right? That is about individual rights in relation to uh, sex or gender or indeed gender ID these days, uh, and on race and ethnicity. So what is there in your work to say that status can be broadened and pick up changes in society? So when Wolfgang wrote his original book, there have been major changes in the social composition of the workforce uh, since then. Um, the the uh, second point is uh, my students. So I teach a course that has material on class, race, and gender. Uh, race and gender are incredibly popular when it comes to doing presentations. Class, not so much. Uh, what can you offer us? Am I to respond right now? I think so. Yeah. If you can. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, no, don't expect uh, 
um, a ready-made recipe for this. Uh, what we can do as, as uh, sociologists uh, or social scientists is to point to uh, possible uh, pathways where uh, things can be addressed that uh, obviously need to be addressed from a perspective of uh, progressive politics. To me, this includes uh, the overcoming uh, of uh, divisions uh, like uh, uh, race and gender uh, in order to form a more comprehensive, uh, uh, you can call it class or, or movement. Uh, how how do you forge uh, solidarity among these uh, uh, ident identity groups where I have this uh, suspicion that when people work at the same workplace and are represented by the same trade union, then suddenly these uh, things get into the background. For example, Germany, uh, the, uh, the Metal Workers Union has from the beginning been staunchly insisting that uh, uh, so-called foreign workers, Turks, whoever, be completely integrated into their system, both in terms of uh, works councillors elected on trade union lists, and in terms of the uh, professional union organizers inside the, the union hierarchy. If now uh, you watch television and you see you see uh, uh, the union official sort of explain what they are doing, I think in fifty percent of uh, of cases they have a Greek or an Italian or a Turkish family name. Yeah, that is absolutely essential, and uh, unions have to open up. Uh, in a sort of a very clear way and determined way uh, to, to have groups that uh, uh, in their membership to be fully represented and perhaps even overrepresented in their staff in order to, uh, to build a community. Just one example. Yeah? Uh, it's very difficult to say much more, but, but I would say that uh, if you want to if you want to organize a battle against capital over what capital has to give us in exchange for us renewing their profit hunting license, so to speak, yeah, what they have to pay for that license, then we have interests that we share. And for that battle, uh, we need to build a united front. Uh, my answer is, if we don't, then we're in big, big trouble. Uh, do you know how to do it? You have inklings. And then there's another thing that, that I would always, when we discuss these things, re rely on. This is the agency, the spontaneity, and the humanity of the human actor. <laughs> People are incredibly inventive. Somebody else? That's me. Thanks very much. This has been really um, fascinating set of presentations. I haven't read the book yet, so apologies if this is already covered. Um, but I was thinking of asking this, and it also follows quite well from the last response in terms of, yeah, any further ideas about organizing and voice for migrant workers. I think it's great to hear about IG Metal and the um, Turkish and, and European workers, but that is a bit easier to do if you're either working under free movement or some kind of, you know, slightly stronger visa regime. And um, we, we've seen that with the academic strikes here, they've just about managed to kind of agree it that, you know, those on the skilled worker visa can get involved, but it's much, much more difficult with some of the more restrictive short-term visa schemes yeah. that we see like in the agricultural sector. And again, more difficult again, if you're irregular 
Um, so yeah, it was just really any any thoughts or reflections on on those points. Thank you, question. It's I don't think it's something we um, address in the book head on. I mean, the book is quite light on on law, on detailed law. But I suppose the point here is, or one of the points is that um, employment status is not, of course, the only status that's constructed by law. Uh, migrant status is also constructed by law. And a point we make in the book is that one of the really important things to understand is how these different statuses interact and are interlinked and interconstructed, I suppose. Um, and something that this is again not a novel point, but something which the law, a law and political economy approach reminds us of is that um, it's not sufficient to think to look at labour law narrowly understood uh, by itself, you know, and it's also not 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 for scholars, but nor for policymakers. And it's so often the case that labor, you know, that, that there's a kind of feeling in government that you can have a, a report on labor law and that's just one thing. And then maybe get Hannah in to talk about labor law. But if you're talking about migration or finance, you don't need to hear from Hannah, you know, and that would be something that, um, yeah, that's another point. To, it doesn't really answer what you've asked, but just some thoughts that came to mind. Any other points or questions? Great, in which case I can ask my question. <laughs> um, so yes, um, I, I've been, this is to everybody in a way, but not everybody will need to reply or want to. So this, I, and there's, there was a debate or ongoing debate in uh, political theory, political philosophy about, the debate has the catchphrase recognition or redistribution. And, and the question is, is it, what's more important, as it were? That we, every group in society should be respected and receive dignity, uh, be treated as an equal, have full democratic participation, that sort of theme. And then there's the older theme, I guess, about what, what we need is a more equal society, redistribution of wealth uh, through collective bargaining, taxation, and so forth. And um, I, I, so if I very, if I caricature our speakers, Hannah, I think was mostly talking about redistribution. <laughs> and you were mostly talking about recognition for care workers as a very important contributor to our society. Richard, I think, was just talking about the revolution. So that, that may not be, <laughs> That may not be quite the same. Um, what we're uh, about. Yeah. Well, I, that's your interpretation of the book. I wasn't sure. So that's the question. So, so I, I mean, I, I wondered reading that last chapter whether actually there was a kind of a shift between the old style of industri industrial democracy, which was really about workers getting together to get a fairer deal, um, a better terms and conditions of employment, to a, a sort of a totally different version of democracy at work where issues about respect for people's jobs, recognition of all the different statuses of their contribution, uh, of, of who they were, and they were independently important, that that, that was kind of uh, really rather more emphasized yeah. in your book than I expected it to be, frankly. So I wondered whether you felt that, whether that was a deliberate move or just mistake of my interpretation of what you're writing. Yeah. I mean, my immediate reaction, thanks for the question here, would be that we wouldn't want to view those two things as alternatives. Um, and I think um, Nancy Fraser's recent book, which I haven't read, but I've watched her talk about uh, on YouTube, um, it's got an unfortunate name, which is, um, what do you call it? Okay. Cannibal, cannibal capitalism. Uh, but what she's arguing is... Reality. <laughs> <laughs> what she's arguing is that um, various struggles for recognition, um, and in, in particular, uh, those of racialized people and of women, should all be understood in terms of the historical development of capitalism. And if you do that, then you get a very clear picture of why all of these struggles uh, or of why all of these different groups share the same struggle ultimately. 
Um, so yeah, not seeing the two as separate. I don't know if I've explained that very well. Yeah, I also, if I may say that, I, I think that uh, um, recognition problems uh, are easier, are, are more easy, are easier to settle than redistribution problems. Yeah, in in my country, which was known to be uh, relatively homogeneous and anti-immigration. Yeah, now I watch television and there is uh, this, someone says the diploma ingenieur uh, um, uh, Giacomo uh, such and such an Italian name. He's he's going to explain something to you. He he speaks in Ruhrgebiet uh, accent. He's grown up there. Yeah, and the fact that he has an Italian name plays no role whatsoever in it. Yeah, so and this is one generation, because the guy was a son of a of an immigrant uh, uh, Italian family in the 1960s. Then went to university, and <laughs> there he is uh, running a public establishment that is in charge of uh, autobahn building. Yeah, uh, the same will happen with women, and it is about to happen. Uh, uh, nobody sort of uh, wonders anymore if the next rector of a university is a woman, in fact, su succeeding a woman, be because this happened all, all, already in, in, in the generation before it. Whereas the, the struggle with, with capital over uh, the needs of human societies not being permanently pushed around by ever new waves of so-called creative destruction, which uh, is perceived as destructive destruction by more and more people, yeah, that struggle is very much more difficult. And, and, and it needs the Turks, the Italians, the women and everybody else on one side. Yeah? In, in that sense, it is fighting that fight, uh, recognition, uh, as of everybody's equal human dignity is a precondition of even starting that fight with some degree of uh, chance that you can prevent. Yeah. I, I don't know if you wanted to respond to Richard's claim that you're, you're revolutionaries. I, I thought you might want to deny that, so I wasn't sure. Yeah, then, then since, since I'm, I'm, I'm just sure. <laughs> see, uh, Richard, Richard and I have known each other for 50 years, a little more. Um, I was for 50 years a great admirer of Richard's, and I must say, uh, I've learned from him an, an amazing amount. Why? Because I started as a reformist social democrat, social democrat with the idea that there are sort of functionalist models of organizing an industrial society that provide for space for worker for workers to fight for their rights, and at the same time uh, uh, somehow strike a compromise uh, with capital and the needs of capital. I've, I've, I've written, uh, in that sense, neo-functionalist, I think pretty smart argument, where Richard always went, oh, oh my God, yeah, don't, don't, don't forget that, there, that there's also the rank and file, which, which you have to reckon with, and they see the world, maybe not in your terms, yeah? I've learned that, and, and, the, and the 20 or 30 years of, of neoliberalism that, that we went through were a lesson to this. Uh, in, in the 1980s, I still thought that if you, uh, if you build a model of high-skilled work in, a, in an industrial society where you can say to capital, capital, if you want to produce here, you have to, you have to pay for decent education of workers that makes them volatile, uh, that, 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 that makes them sort of usable for all sorts of other uh, things so that they can adjust to rapid industrial change. And you have to change your products 
so that your products become more value, uh, uh, you know, more, more valuable, so that you can survive in money. What, what have we seen? We've seen that capital, if you tell them that you have to do this and this and this and that in order to be allowed to produce here, then they can say, thank you very much, then we produce somewhere else. Yeah, that was what we learned in the 1990s. So from, from, from this experience, I would say that there was always something to what Richard tried to, to tell us and to teach us that uh, uh, much more emphasis must be laid on, uh, on the agency of organized people where their organizations play a very important role in, in, in forming collective identities and that the smartest technocratic models have a, uh, have a shelf life of about 10 years and then they are gone because capitalism has this enormous dynamic. And, and so I would say, uh, what, what do you mean by revolutionary? Uh, if you have a Leninist idea of revolution, or I may say to Richard, the Trotsky uh, uh, idea of revolution, then this thing is over in two or three years. There is a com committee and the committee says, uh, now capitalism is over from tomorrow on uh, communism or socialism. Uh, in this, it was only one system that could be finished like this. This was communism. But when Yeltsin uh, sort of in 1990 said, guys, from tomorrow on, we have capitalism here, uh, communism is over. But that is not the kind of revolution that we can that we can think about. So the revolution must take place in the way in which people relate to each other and to politics. And that is a long-term process of collective learning. Uh, if that fails, then we're all in big in big trouble. And that we should say. And that's something we try to say. My instructions were to give uh, you two the last word. I think uh, you feel I, you're there. I would just like to say thanks again to everyone. It's been an absolute pleasure to listen to these presentations. Um, thank you for giving up your time. Learned a lot. Learned a lot. Uh -huh.